what did you do last night? A bit of Netflix? Disney Plus? NT Live? At the same time, we all know, don't we, that the people who made that content are now not working. If they're lucky, they've been furloughed, but most likely they're not earning anything at all. Recently, the famous violinist Tasman Little told BBC listeners that out of five to six million streams of her work, she'd received £12.34. And meanwhile, Netflix market value is around £20 billion. So what has changed? First of all, I'm going to take a longer view of the creative economy. And then I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID, the changes on top of those changes. So first of all, how do we value creative content? Well, cultural products only acquire meaning and value in the mind's eye of the beholder. What's more, value is social and relational. How we feel about a piece of music or a film depends not only on who we are, but who we are with, who we like, who we want to be like. Do you like my bookshelf? Do you like my video? Do you like me? So cultural products are experiential goods and they are social goods. And the viewer experience is the place where value is created or co-created. And that means that cultural products are highly unpredictable. It's a very risky business. And that risk is spread unevenly along the supply chain. At the point of origination, nobody knows anything. But the closer you get to the consumer, the clearer things become. We move from a zone of risk into a zone of exploitation. Now, content creators, artists, writers, musicians, live in the zone of risk. Most of their work is unpaid. And at the other end of the supply chain, in the zone of exploitation, there are some very big businesses. They are not in the risky business of cultural production. They are in the far more profitable business of cultural consumption. Competing for consumers in the attention economy, selling attention and data to advertisers, bundling content in order to sell broadband packages and so on. Now, the big change in our lifetime is that that content is now mostly digital. And the big intermediaries are not traditional publishers or record labels. They're big tech companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. And unlike the old intermediaries, they make no pretense to invest in content. With a few exceptions, like Netflix Originals or Amazon Prime, they uh, are not in the business of making content. In fact, they are, if anything, actively undermining copyright by facilitating privacy. In effect, they give ownership of digital content from the producer to the cultural consumer. In this digital creative economy, content is not king. Content is free and it's very hard to compete against free. So if you're not being paid for your content, how do you make a living? Well, actually, content creators have risen to this challenge. They have realised that their livelihoods depend on building relationships with fans in the embodied physical world and online. Musicians can't make a living from recording, but they can make money from live gigs. Authors have to spend time blogging and tweeting, not just writing. In fact, most creative people have to maintain a social media presence, and that takes a lot of time, but it's part of the job. But all that activity needs a payoff. You still need at some point to sell something. And that something is likely, not always, but often, something physical, outside the digital creative economy. A book, a concert, a reading, a live performance, a festival. And these physical objects and encounters need physical places, bookshops, theatres, pubs, concert halls. And of course... That physical object, that physical encounter is today and for the foreseeable future no longer available. Our artists are making trailers for a film which nobody can watch. We've pushed content creators into new and innovative models of marketing and relationship building, but the infrastructure and the audiences which support them have suddenly vanished. And of course, all this applies not just to artists, poets and musicians, there's a whole army of cultural workers whose livelihoods depend upon these interactions. Costume designers, sound mixers, choreographers 
And then the extended economy of ice creams, printers, hotels. When we lose the physical, cultural economy, a lot of other lives and livelihoods are being lost. And of course, there can be innovations. Creative people are resourceful. I recently heard about a virtual book festival set up by an author where you can join in while working in a care home instead of having to rent a very expensive cottage in Hay on Wye. A sitar player and an opera singer collaborating and sharing their work online. People outside London being included in digital conversations when they were excluded from the old networks. So digital allows new ways of working in the creative economy, in some ways more inclusive, more innovative. We just need to find new ways for artists to get paid for that work. Otherwise, when we come out of this in six weeks or six months or a year or whenever it is, we will find our abundant digital media channels stuck on repeat with no new talent, no new ideas, no future. Well, as cultural consumers, we're part of this problem and we're part of the solution. We choose how to spend our time, what to pay for, who to pay to. And if we can afford those choices, we need to think about what is really valuable in our creative economy. It's a bit like any market, go local, go artisan, go organic, try to feed the other end of the supply chain, not just the big streaming giants in the zone of exploitation. And maybe we'll all come out of this healthier, happier and wiser.